All right, hello students. Happy Monday, April 13th. Good to see you. And um, we're having our second video lecture. Today is all about um, photosynthesis and the different parts of plants. So hello, you can say hello, they can see your faces. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm actually going to do a quick photosynthesis uh, review of the notes that you took last week. Okay, let me minimize this part. Okay, so last week you took some notes about photosynthesis and I asked you to recall in sixth grade you learned about cells. Okay, so you learn about the different parts of cells on the inside, they have these things called organelles. They're like mini organs inside of cells. And one of the most important organelles that you learn about were chloroplasts. And chloroplasts are in plant cells only. Hopefully you learn about animal and plant cells. And um, you should have learned that chloroplasts are the special organelle in plant cells that do photosynthesis. And this is what it looks like. Okay. Um, so photosynthesis is made of, the word itself is, is made of these two parts. Photo means light, like photography, uses light to um, capture pictures. And then synthesis means to make, like synthesize or synthetic fabrics, remember? So photosynthesis is the process that plants use to um, create things. By things, I mean glucose, and oxygen is a byproduct of that. Um, and it does that by using light. So photosynthesis is that process. And then you all drew this wonderful diagram. Many of you sent your notes to us. Thank you very much. They looked great. And we just wanted you to note that there are three things that go into the plant. Those are the reactants. So light goes, light is used by the plant. Carbon dioxide gets sucked in through the leaves and water gets sucked up through the roots. And then um, the products, the things that get produced by the plant during this photosynthesis process is uh, oxygen and glucose, the sugars, okay? And then right here we have the chemical formulas. Uh, H2O, you already know that one. CO2, you're experts on that. Oxygen is O2. And then glucose is this fancy chemical formula, C6H12O6. So it's this long chain of all these carbons, hydrogens, and oxygen stuck together. And um, we asked you to watch this cool Venus flytrap video. Um, basically, we said that carnivorous plants, they still photosynthesize, but because they don't get enough nutrients from the dirt in the habitats that they live in, they need to get extra nutrients. And so that's why they need to eat uh, in addition to photosynthesizing. But most other plants, they don't need to eat to survive because they make their own food um, by doing photosynthesis. And that's why plants are considered autotrophs. So auto means self and uh, troph means nourishment or feeding. Okay, so plants, they feed themselves by creating their own food. So as you know, most plants, you know, except for these Venus flytraps, they don't really have mouths or stomachs. They make their own food by doing photosynthesis and then they eat that food. And um, us, on, their, uh, on the other hand, we're not autotrophs. We can't make our own food by standing in the sun. We have to eat other things to get our energy. Okay. Uh, oh, and uh, one of the most important points from last week's photosynthesis notes is that, is that photosynthesis is a chemical reaction. Um, and we've been learning about that. So you're experts. Remember, on this side of any chemical equation, is the reactants, okay? These are the things that react in the chemical reaction in order to produce these products on the other side. So glucose and oxygen get produced by this photosynthesis chemical reaction and the reactants are carbon dioxide and water. And if you remember, we can count how many carbons, oxygen, and hydrogens are on this side and how many carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens are on this side um, and they should match, it should be balanced because Remember the um, conservation of matter, there's no new matter that gets created or destroyed. So it's the same number of atoms on both sides of the equation. Okay. Um, and then we watched, we asked you to watch this cool video where 
uh, when they turn the light on, you see the bubbles coming out of this Elodia plant. And when they turn the light off, the bubbles stop coming out. And that means that photosynthesis happens when there's light. So and many of you wrote in your notes to me that you noticed that and you, you're wondering if photosynthesis only happens during the day. That's true because it needs that light from the sun or light from a lamp if you're doing it in um, raising plants indoors in order for photosynthesis to happen. So you know that because if we go back to this equation, right, oxygen is one of the things that's being produced, okay? So you know that if oxygen is being produced in the form of these bubbles, and you can see that really well in this underwater plant, um, then you know that photosynthesis is actively happening. And then when they turn the light off, you see that photosynthesis, that chemical reaction stops right away. So it was uh, kind of cool to see that. Okay, right. <clears throat> hello everyone. Welcome back to my chat. I mean, sorry. <laughs> Welcome back <laughs> to uh, me speaking. So what do you know about plants? You're going to be filling out this bubble map similar to what we did in class when we started our chemistry lecture. Okay, so I want you to fill in four things that you know about plants. You can, it can be a bullet point, it could be a sentence, it can be a word, a phrase, it can even be a picture. I challenge you to do more than four though, because I know we know more than four things about plants. So you can pause the video and take about two minutes or as much time as you need to fill in this bubble map. Do this in your notebook, please. <laughs> oh yeah, do this in your notebook. Okay, so <laughs> I hope you complete that in the two minutes. So now we're going to continue on with our lecture. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the different types of plants. So when we think about plants, there are vascular plants and non-vascular plants. Some examples of vascular plants are mosses liverwort, and liverworts. As you can see here, we have a picture of a liverwort, a hornwort, and a moss. And then also in vascular plants, it can be categorized between plants with seeds and seedless plants. The seedless plants include ferns, horse tails and club mosses. And this picture is an example of a fern. And then with plants with seeds, you have angiosperms and gymnosperms. Gymnosperms are pine trees or fir trees. And angiosperms are monocots and dicots. Examples of monocots are grasses, lilies, palm trees, ginkgo trees, tulips, daffodils. Oh, that makes me sad. We would have seen ginkgos at the, at, our, at the botanical garden on our field trip. And dicots. There's flowers, vegetables, and deciduous trees. And some differences between monocots and dicots is when you're looking at the seeds, there's one cotyledon. <laughs> I can't see. Cotyledon. <laughs> <laughs> and then for dicots, there's two cotyledons. And then for the roots, monocots have fibrous roots and dicots have tap roots. And then when you look at the, like the stems or something, if you cut them in half, like the vascular system, that's what they call it. It's kind of like in us, how we have like veins and, arter and arteries to carry like blood and oxygen throughout our body. Plants have a vascular system to carry um, water and nutrients and sugar. And then in monocots, it's scattered, while in dicots, it's ringed. And for the leaves, um, for monocots, they're parallel veins, and in dicots, they're net-like veins. And for the flowers, the monoco monocots have multiples of three, while the dicots, they have four or five petals in their flowers. And here's some more examples of monocots and dicots. So onion, corn, rice, and sugarcane are monocots, and tomatoes, cabbage, apples, and peaches are dicots. And now we're moving on to plant structures for photosynthesis and reproduction. So 
In your notebook, I want you to draw this chart. I want you to look at this strawberry plant, take two quantitative and two qualitative observations for before, not the after. That is for after you learn the parts of a plant. So if you remember, quantitative is like quantity. Remember, that's what numbers. And qualitative is like qualities. You're just making observations, for example, how something looks. So I remember a long time ago, we did the <clears throat> lab with the grasshoppers, and you had to take um, quantitative and qualitative observations. So some people said for quantitative, like they had two uh two legs were missing from a grasshopper and then a qualitative one was like their legs are hairy there is no numbers involved in qualitative okay so you can pause the video copy this chart down and fill out the before quantitative and qualitative observations and when you're done you can unpause it and we're going to continue with the lecture okay so Hopefully you drew the chart and made your before observations. Now we're gonna move on. So now I'm gonna teach you about the vascular plant structure. Like uh, we're gonna go over this diagram. Please copy this diagram in your notebook. So the parts of a plant. So above anything above the ground or the soil, that's what we call the shoot system. And anything below ground, that's what we call the root system. Okay, so the first part we're going to go over is flowers. So flowers help in <clears throat> reproduction. They attract pollinators and they also make seeds. They attract pollinators because they have like these really bright colors. You know, if you've seen flowers, like they're really beautiful red colors, pink colors, orange colors, yellow colors, blue colors, like almost any color you can imagine. And this is what attracts the pollinators to come to it because they're aesthetically pleasing. And we have leaves, which performs photosynthesis, as you already learned about from the previous lecture and what Ms. Kwan reviewed. And we also have fruits, which protect the seeds. And also, as you know, we as humans, we consume the fruits. And also there are food storages. And inside of fruits, there are seeds. And we also eat those like we call them legumes. That's like nuts or beans. And they're highly nutritious because all of the nutrients that were stored to uh, grow this fruit are inside of these seeds. And also <clears throat> there's stems which support um, the plants. And inside the stem, remember I was talking about the vascular system, and there's water, starch, and sugar are found in the stem. And also below ground in our root system, we have the roots which absorb water and minerals and this is important because they need roots so they can be on land because before um, plants used to be in the water and they're always surrounded by water but now that they're on land they struggle with sometimes finding water so you know if you always have to water your plants because if you do not water your plants they will die Okay, so we're going to return to our plant observation chart that we drew. <clears throat> and we're going to look at the strawberry plant again. And now we're focusing on the after. So now you're going to make two quantitative and two qualitative observations after I went over the structures of the plant. So I want you to use these key words. So what do you notice now about the strawberry plant? Okay, you have a couple minutes to complete this, so pause the video if you need to. Okay, so now that you completed the after observations, we're gonna move on to how do seed plants reproduce? <clears throat> so we're gonna be drawing this table in our notebook. So we're gonna be filling out this chart as we go, make sure that you give yourself enough room. I would highly suggest that you take a whole page up for this chart. So on one side of the chart, it's going to be male parts, in the middle, flower parts, and on the other side, female parts. And make sure you draw the lines that are dividing. I know it's not in blue, but you need to include that. <clears throat> in the middle, you're going to draw 
uh, this for the flower parts. So make sure you draw this uh, flower, make sure you label the pistol, which has a stigma, the style, and the ovary. Make sure you label the stamen, which has the anther and filament. And once again, your drawing is in the middle part that says flower parts. So you can pause the video <clears throat> so you can complete this. Okay, so now we're going to be focusing on the male parts and their definitions. So I just put this here so you know that we're focusing on this side, the male part side. And on the next slide, as you can see, this is what we're going to be filling in. <clears throat> so the stamen is the male reproductive organ. It includes the anther and the filament. The anther is the structure at the tip of the stamen that produces pollen. And the filament is a long tube that connects the anther to the base of the flower. Okay, so now we're going to be focusing on the female parts of a flower. So <clears throat> the female part includes the pistil, which is the re female reproductive organ. It includes the stigma, style, and ovary. The stigma is the sticky structure at the tip of the pistil where pollen can land. And the style is a long tube that connects the stigma to the base of the flower. And the ovary contains ovules or eggs, which become seeds after fertilization. So it's very <clears throat> similar to the reproductive system when we learned about our cells and health last semester, how the females, you know, they have ovaries and eggs inside. Well, so do the flowers. They have ovaries and they have eggs, which become seeds. Okay, so just, I just wanted to point this out. That's kind of interesting. Like when you eat a fruit, like right here, this apple, it actually, you're actually eating um, an ovary of a plant. So that's kind of interesting. I didn't know that either before. Something to think about next time you eat an apple. All right, so now I'm gonna be talking about the um, angiosperm uh, flowering plant life cycle. Okay, so basically <clears throat> pollen, okay, which is produced right here in the anther, if you have, a, have some time later in this week, you can go outside, look at any flower, doesn't matter what kind, maybe you've got some in your house, near your house, right outside your house, but you can find uh, all these parts inside of every single flower. So if you look at the anther, that's on the tip right here, and there's pollen, powdery stuff on there. And inside the pollen is the plant sperm, okay? So you learn that inside the ovary are the plant eggs. Well, the plant um, flower, the whole flower is the reproductive part of the plant. So the sperm is right here in the anther and um, it's held inside of pollen grains. And what happens is pollen grains travel by wind, water, gravity, or with the help of animals like bees and butterflies or birds from the anther and it can land on the stigma right here, the tip. This tip is real sticky so that it can catch those pollen grains. And flowers can either um, fertilize themselves, so a pollen grain right here from the anther can land directly on the stigma of the same flower, or they can um, fertilize a different flower from a different plant further away. Okay, next what happens is, okay, we're zooming in right here to the top of the stigma. If we're zooming in, this is what it looks like. Okay, this pollen grain lands on the stigma, okay? And then this pollen grain starts to grow this tube and it's called a pollen tube. And it grows it all the way down. So it lands right here on top of the stigma, right? It grows it all the way down down the style and it goes into the ovary because that's where the eggs are, that's where the sperm need to go. Okay, so, um, so the pollen tube grows all the way down to the ovary and once it hits the egg or the ovules, the sperm get released from the pollen and it goes into the egg right here and it fertilizes the egg, just like how we learned about for human reproduction. What happens after that is the fertilized egg now goes through this process called mitosis where it starts to grow and it becomes something called a zygote. Okay, so now we're starting to get the makings of a plant baby. 
and then the ovary, which is the whole bottom part of the, the um, female reproductive structure, the pistil, it starts to grow and it grows into a fruit. And what's on the inside of the fruit, it's the seed, the plant baby, right? If you plant a seed, a new plant grows. That's the baby that was created from the sperm fertilizing the egg. So like Ms. Brown said, when you eat the fruit, any kind of fruit, you're eating the ovary of a plant and then the seed is the plant baby that was made by fertilization and the wonderful process of pollination. Okay, so when the seed gets planted, it can grow into a new plant. And then when that plant grows and makes its own flowers, it's a whole complete life cycle. Okay, so a mature angiosperm plant. Angiosperms are any plants that have flowers. Um, the life cycle repeats and then new, um, new flowers get pollinated and new seeds are produced and new plant babies are made. All right, guys, so now we're going to be learning about the adaptations in plants. Okay, so how do plants adapt to photosynthesis when they are deprived of water? Okay, so you can see the succulents, their, seed, um, their leaves are very small. Okay, and they do this to reduce the surface area um, of their leaves in order to prevent too much water loss. Okay, so previously I had talked to you guys a little bit about the stomata and how they open and close. Well, if the leaf is very big, they have a bigger opportunity to lose water, okay? And this leads me on to um, plants deciding when is the best time to open their stomata. So in some, some plants, um, they open their stomata during the day. Okay, the little boy is looking at the stomata being open during the day, and that's because the environmental conditions are like perfect, and they're not in, at risk of losing water. Okay, they're they're in a, a stable environment. Uh, but there's some plants, like the desert plants, cactus here, who have to um, open their stomata at night to release the oxygen and to prevent too much water loss. Okay, so that's the difference between how, I mean, sorry, how plants adapt to their loss of water. Okay, and then the next adaptation is what do plants do? Okay, how do plants adapt to photosynthesis when they have, when they are deprived from sunlight? So the opposite happens here, okay? So when there's too much, I mean, when there's not enough sunlight, okay, the, the leaves, they have to be very big. Okay, so you can see here on the left, these um, leaves are probably bigger than the palm of my hand. And then this other leaf over here, I saw some of these big broad leaves in Costa Rica and they have to be that big because all the canopy trees are covering them from getting any sunlight. So they have to take advantage of being big and maybe one ray of sunlight lands on the entire leaf and they'll be able to photosynthesize, okay? And then there's other plants like these vines over here. They compete um, to reach the sun. So they have these little legs, they're called tendrils, and they use them to climb up the tree. And they can get, like they can cover the entire tree and then the tree is losing the opportunity to get sunlight, but the vine is reaching the sunlight. So those are two ways that plants have adapted to, in order to reach the sunlight. Okay, and then plants have also ensured um, to make sure that their seeds are traveling away from the parent plant. So some of these seeds here that you can, that are on this picture, you may notice as sunflower seeds, as pumpkin seeds, as legumes, as I said before, okay? They're all in different shapes and they're all in different sizes. And one of the ways that plants make sure that they are dispersing their seeds as far as they can from the parent plant is taking advantage of the wind. Okay, so some seeds like the dandelion, um, uh, they, they make their seeds very lightweight, okay? And they have this little fan right here that allows it to be picked up by the wind, okay? And then once when it's very windy, the dandelion will be shaking and they'll be losing their seeds and then they'll fly and then hopefully they'll be as far away as the parent plant because they're trying to um, populate as much as they can, okay? And then the next way, 
way is taking advantage of water. So this coconut, it, it fell from a coconut tree and luckily it rolled off the island, okay? And now it's in the water. It can float because there's some water in there and it's, but there's also air in, that's caught inside. So that's why the coconut can float. And the water current is going to move the coconut seed, hopefully to a new island or into our hands, okay? And if it makes it to a new island, it's gonna uh, form roots and then it'll find a way to burrow in and then hopefully we'll get a new coconut tree and it'll find its new place to grow. Okay, the next way is through gravity. I don't know if you guys have ever seen um, these, these seeds that, I mean, these fruits that nobody eats, <laughs> but they make this palm tree. Okay, and gravity, you know, the same one that pushes down on us to stay on land, well, that same gravity is pushing those seeds off the palm tree. Okay, and they're going to do the same thing. They're going to move away to a different part of the island, and then they're going to create this whole new palm tree. And lastly, we have animals. Okay, so some animals um, have to eat the fruit around in order to open the seed that's inside. Okay, so animals eat the fruit. You know, this bird is eating the fruit on this tree, but it's just eating it, right? And it eats it whole. And then it goes to another tree, and when the seed comes out of its poop, it's in a different place. It's no longer close to the parent plant. So then the new, um, the, the seed that came out of the bird is going to have a new place to grow away from the parent plant. And then a long, long time ago, we had, um, well, we still have the tamba, tambalokoki tree. Okay, this tree was found on the Galapagos Island where they, um, a famous scientist found the biggest diversity of animals and plants. Okay, and this seed, if you can tell here, it's big, it's so big. And it was only possible for this bird over here, it's called the dodo, to eat that seed and go through its, I mean, sorry, to eat the fruit. And the whole thing would go inside of the dodo's body Okay, and then they would poop it out. But this dodo bird no longer is ex is existent, it's extinct. So now the tambalokoki tree is having trouble dispersing their seeds because the only animal that was around um, to take off the fruit, to remove the flesh, um, there's nobody who likes this fruit anymore. So now the tree is having trouble dispersing their seeds. Okay, and finally, fruit versus vegetable. Okay, so everything that we eat has, I'm sorry, not everything, but every fruit that we eat has been developed from an ovary. Okay, so like Miss Brown said, the seeds are inside and everything around it, that flesh around, is the ovary, okay? And in biology, okay, the term vegetable it doesn't have a true definition besides the fact that culinary people and chefs, they have to name everything else that we eat that is not an ovary, okay? So when we eat lettuce, you're not eating the ovary, you're eating the plant leaves, okay? So that's why it's called a vegetable. Or when you eat a celery, you're eating the plant stem. And when you eat a potato, okay, you're eating the plant root. So anything that is not the ovary is labeled vegetable, okay? But that's not some biological information. And that's it for today's Zoom meeting. I hope you enjoyed our short lecture. <laughs> if you have any questions, please ask. All right, everyone, thanks for watching. Remember to um, submit um, your notes. We're not giving you a grade for them until we collect them for the notebook check, but Make sure you still take pictures of everything that you're supposed to write down and send it to us. And if there are things that you have not sent to us from before, um, please send it to us as soon as possible through Remind, email, Schoology, which is the best way, or, um, or through text. All right. Be safe. Have a great week. Goodbye. Bye.